So we've looked at the hardware that is required to acquire optical fringes with a two telescope interferometer. We've actually seen that it is possible to combine more than two telescopes simultaneously and yet being able to extract interferometric signals out of our data. There is, however, one piece of detail that we have overlooked so far that will actually play an important part uh, in the story we try to tell about interferometry. And we need to go back to a picture you've already seen, that of the two telescope interferometer pointing at a target that is away from transit, at an angle theta away from transit, a zenithal angle. Now, our two telescope interferometer is the same, it is still separated by the baseline B, and we've just, uh, for now, forget about the, uh, the underground delay line system that we've highlighted previously. I want to focus on the uh, yellow triangle that I have highlighted in the picture you see on the screen here. It is a triangle that uh, we've already encountered and uh, for which we've already mentioned two of the sides of this triangle. The first side, the bottom side, is obviously the baseline, the actual distance that separates our two telescopes on the ground that form the baseline B. One of the sides that we've seen also is B sine theta. And this side has to do with the optical delay that is introduced by the simple fact that we are pointing a target away from transit with our two telescope interferometer. And that is the uh, side that, uh, of that triangle that required the introduction of additional hardware into our system. Um, and that was the whole story, the whole reason behind the introduction of delay lines in the interferometers. Now there is a third line to this, a uh, third side to this triangle, and that is of course B cosine theta. Um, trigonometry works all the time, and it uh, has to do with the fact that perceived, seen from the point of view of the star, the interferometry baseline seems to shrink as you go away from transit. And here you have an example, and if we uh, increase that angle theta, we go even further away from transit, that's going to emphasize this effect. And you can see that from the point of view of the star, it seems like the distance between the two telescopes is actually shrinking. The exact details of how that baseline is going to shrink uh, turn out to matter a lot to the observations we are trying to make. They depend a lot on the actual geometry of our interferometer and its orientation relative to uh, the Earth rotation axis. And so um, I'm going to show you uh, two types of baselines. The first one is, would be an interferometric baseline oriented in the north-south axis. We're going to place ourselves from the point of view of the star and instead of um, seeing the, the, the sky move here, we're just going to look at Earth as it rotates around its axis and we're going to see the interferometer move along with the surface of Earth. The two apertures are uh, along a north-south axis and as Earth rotates, we see that from the point of view of the target, the interferometer seems to rotate. The baseline made by the two apertures seems somehow to mostly rotate um, by, by a certain amount. And um, if you look at, um, if you try to plot at things in a slightly different way, on the, on the left side of the plot, I show you the two telescopes T1 and T2 forming a baseline along the north-south axis. And on the right, I, I, um, I plot the baseline, the effective baseline, the way it is perceived by uh, the star. Now, between two telescopes, you can always form two baselines. There's the baseline between one and two, and the baseline between two and one. Of course, they are, they are exactly equivalent, and uh, we could very well uh, ignore one of them, but we usually tend to plot them all together and um, 
to so as to produce uh, symmetric plots uh, in uh, uh, like the one you have here on the screen. And what we see is that the instantaneous baseline B12 or B21, as time progresses, simply seems to um, rotate uh, in what we call the UV plane, or the, the plane of the spatial frequencies that are uh, sampled by our interferometer. The situation is slightly different if you consider a baseline that is oriented on the east-west axis. Um, you see that as Earth rotates, the, the, the fact that the two apertures, the two telescopes, seem to uh, get further away from each other and then back closer to each other is enhanced by, simply by the geometric of the projection. And so for an east-west baseline, uh, a baseline seems to rotate a little bit, but also uh, significantly scale up and down as it crosses the, the meridian. If you look at things again in the plot I've mentioned earlier, only this time we have a baseline oriented on the east-west axis, uh, you see that the, uh, effective instantan the instantaneous effective baseline uh, do, does still rotate a little bit, but uh, in addition to the previous rotation effect, we see that the baseline indeed expands and then eventually shrinks back. Those two things, they mean two, uh, they have two consequences. The first is that, and that seems to be a somewhat unfortunate consequence, that your interferometer only provides you with the full angular resolution uh, when observing exactly at the transit. As soon as it starts going away from transit, in a way you're beginning to lose some of the resolution uh, provided by a given baseline. But a more fortunate consequence of this is that although, with, although you have a single uh, pair of telescopes forming only one baseline, which in theory would only give you access to one measurement, the fact that the baseline shrinks and rotates actually gives you access to many more points uh, in the plane of the spatial frequencies you're trying to sample. And, and so uh, the, one way to, to, to look at it, to summarize all of these ideas, is that the fact that the, the diurnal motion, uh, simply the, the, the motion that is uh, experienced because of the uh, rotation of Earth around its axis, makes that one baseline is actually going to cover not just a single point in the uh, UV plane, but um, a, a, an actual track uh, in that plane. The consequence is that one baseline is actually going to provide you with several coherence measurements at several places in the UV plane, which is good. More observables, more quantities that will help you characterize the object you're observing. You're going to populate the UV plane uh, if you involve more and more baselines together. And that is important. The However, the details as to exactly how well you populate your UV plane, in addition to the geometry of your interferometer, are going to depend on uh, two other facts, two other quantities. The first one is going to be at what latitude your interferometer is actually located at the surface of Earth. There will be a very different behavior if you use an interferometer that is located on the equator or if you're using an interferometer at the north or the south pole, for example. You're going to have very different properties from this. And the other quantity that matters quite a bit is the uh, declination of your target. How far away from the celestial equator that target actually lies. And we're going to look at one example uh, for one interferometer that would be made of uh, six telescopes. Uh, mostly are uh, organized around a, a Y-shaped configuration, like the one you have on the screen here. Now, these six telescopes form many baselines. They actually form 15 uh, independent baselines that result 
on the left on the right side hand of the uh, the right hand side plot you have on the screen into 30 points uh, that that figure again is completely symmetric so for the 15 baselines you get 15 complementary baselines that we just plot here for uh, because it makes a prettier symmetric picture that would be what we call the coverage of the UV plane the UV coverage when the telescope all of the interferometer are the telescopes are all pointing exactly at zenith. We're going to place that interferometer at a latitude of about 35 degrees that roughly corresponds to the uh, latitude where the Chara array uh, happens to be located, which is the example I picked for this picture. And we're going to look at the way the, uh, the, the, the shape of the UV tracks for a an object that would be located at different uh, declinations. And so we're looking at the tracks uh, for a, an observation that covers six hours of observation. And we progressively go from um, a negative declination to a declination of now 15 and then 25, and a declination that matches the uh, actual uh, latitude of our interferometer and keep progressing further away. What we observe is that uh, we get some significantly different behaviors for our UV tracks depending on whether we observe um, away from the north or toward the north. And uh, a lot of the art in designing an interferometric array uh, has to do with the um, choosing exactly where to put our apertures so as to optimize the coverage of the UV plane. Each of the points you see in this picture, in the right hand side picture, is going to be an independent measurement um, of coherence on the target that will uh, then be combined all together using the Van Sitter-Zanicke theorem to infer properties on the object we are observing.